Thanks a lot, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, hopefully you all won't get too overly excited. I'm doing the intro talk. So it's going to be short and sweet, hopefully give you enough context to understand uh, the following talks, which is where most of the interesting stuff is. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about you know, what Apache Beam is, why it exists. Um, how many of you are familiar with Beam? Not bad. Um, I'm going to then do a crash course on sort of kind of what you can do with Beam, just a you know, very simple explanation of things. Like how many of you are familiar with, say, Spark or Flink? Now we're talking. So for, for most of you that raise your hands, you'll, you'll be very bored with that. Sorry. Uh, but we wanted to at least make sure folks had a rough idea of, of the kinds of things we were talking about. Uh, then I'm going to talk briefly about kind of the roadmap that we're looking at in the near term with Beam, uh, specifically around Beam's portability layer. Uh, and then I'll talk about ways to get involved, uh, both sort of as just a, a contributor out of the kindness of your heart and also uh, if you want to get paid to do this stuff. Uh, so why Apache Beam? I mean, I've got like six slides here to, to kind of send a, a simple message, but you know, there's all sorts of reasons these days why we want to process data, right? Like you've got data coming in, uh, you want to analyze user behavior, you want to understand something about the world, uh, and the more data you look at, the more, you know, kind of the more data you have to handle, and you start doing this on lots of machines, and you start doing lots of different versions of this, and you're, you're doing this all ad hoc, and then your life is suddenly hell. Uh, and you know all the sort of increasing devices in the world just make it harder and harder. Uh, you know, so you're you know you're kind of building these ad hoc systems, and, and you end up realizing that you're really kind of you know, building pipelines that that do specific types of operations, and it'd be a lot nicer to use a framework that helps you out. So then you decide to go and and, and find one, and you, you just sort of try to figure out which one to use because there's dozens of these things, and they're just always changing and growing, and new ones are coming, and they're getting better and getting worse. And so the the vision with Beam is that. You know, we really should try to find, you know, kind of the, the, the core model, the core foundations of, of what it is to do data processing. Um, and you should be able to, to write what you want to do in data processing in whatever language you want. Like, you don't want to be a Java programmer that's going to show up and have to use C++. You don't want to be a Node.js programmer that's going to show up and have to use Java, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then... You know, for, for the core of the stuff that you want to do, you probably should be able to run this on any engine that you want to run it on. You know, the new engines are showing up with new capabilities. Some are more performance, some are less performance, but, you know, work in a better environment, in a different environment or something like that. Uh, it'd be really nice to not have to rewrite your pipelines, you know, learn new frameworks, et cetera, you know, be pigeonholed into a specific language, Java. So, uh, you know, the, the vision for Beam is that, you know, you can, you can write your pipelines in whatever language you want and then run them on whatever, whatever engine you want. Uh, and, then, and then these two worlds, kind of the, 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 the world of SDKs that let you write pipelines and the world of runners that kind of provide the engine capabilities can, can kind of motivate and challenge each other and, and really help, help push the other forward uh, in the state of the art. Uh, so for those of you that didn't raise your hand when I asked you if you knew what Spark or Flink or other things were like, we're going to do a quick crash course to explain what exactly you can do uh, with something like Beam. Uh, there's a few different types of operations in Beam. The, the, the core one is this thing called a pardo that's just short for parallel do. Uh, and it's really similar to a flat map or map operation. It's basically kind of an element-wise transformation. So Every element gets processed independently. You can imagine how this is easy to, to shard across lots of machines. This is things like things like filtering, converting dates. You know anything that's kind of element-wise. It can also be explosions, so prefix prefix or postfix explosions. Um, another interesting type of operation they support are, are kind of aggregations. So these are things like per key com combines, uh, reductions, uh, and this is where you're you're grouping items by some key and, and combining them. Uh, when you're when you're doing this in a streaming uh, uh, streaming context, this is turning it into a stateful comp computation. Uh, and there's lots of different variations on this to give you kind of automatic optimizations under the hood for if you're doing like associative and commutative, commutative functions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know the, the the main thing here is that you're taking in lots of elements, combining them together, and creating some new output. So maybe it's histograms, you know, maybe you're computing sums, whatever. Um, and then another thing that Beam brings to the table uh, is this idea of event time windowing. Um, so when I say event time windowing, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, somewhere in between the, the number of people that know Beam and the number of people that know Spark. Uh, so when we're, you know, when you're dealing with event data, so so you know, ev 
events that happened in time. So some users on some mobile game, you know, creating scores or, or doing something, and you're wanting to, to analyze those events within the, the context of, of where they occurred in time. Uh, you care about that, that time that that event happened. That's the event time, right? But due to the nature of distributed systems, those events don't always show up at the, the pipelines at the time uh, when they happen, right? It would be great if, if an event happens and it gets processed immediately. Life would be very simple. But, you know, you've got folks on mobile phones with, with sketchy connections or maybe they're in airplane mode. Uh, you've got distributed systems that have hiccups or just, you know, arbitrary delays. Things can get, can get uh, reordered in the network. And so uh, you can end up with, with things showing up at, at very weird times, and you, have, you need to sort of shuffle them back into place of, of where they actually occurred with an event time if you want to analyze them correctly in that context. So that's what event time windowing gives you. Uh, and the frameworks within Beam make it really easy to just specify, you know, hey, I've got these timestamps on my, on my incoming data. I want to window it into some kind of windowing scheme, like fixed windows, you know, slicing up time into even chunks, or you've got much more advanced, interesting things. Uh, but it basically gives you nice, uh, nice, clean, and simple ways to analyze events, you know, as they happen in time, uh, without too much, too much cognitive overhead. Um, oh yeah, so you can tell I stole these slides because I forgot there was an animation. Uh, so there's, you know, you can look in this stream of data. And those three events all happened at the same time, 8 o'clock. But you can see the, you know, like the red one shows up relatively close to 8 o'clock, but that green one showed up very late. That's an example of sort of skew uh, with an event time. Uh, another way to think about this is if you plot, plot this on uh, sort of a two-dimensional graph, we have two dimensions of time here. So event time on the bottom is, is plotting you know, where in event time this actually happened. So this is, this is the, you know, the times that the events themselves occurred. And processing time, the, the y-axis is, is showing us when those events actually show up uh, at the pipeline and get processed. Uh, and you can think of, you know, if you want to carve up uh, event time into, say, fixed windows, you know, those windows are all going to be basically vertical swaths through this, right? So like the, that orange kind of vertical, vertical bar area gives you like say one hour of time and the next to it is the following hour. Uh, and so uh, any vertical distance uh, in this graph is, is, is essentially capturing that, that kind of skew between when an event happened uh, and when it was actually processed. So that's sort of the, the delay between when an event happened and when the system was able to see it. Uh, and if everything you know, was right on that dashed line, that would be that, that perfect case that I talked about earlier of an event happens and it's processed immediately. But reality looks more like this, where you've got a lot of things that are maybe kind of close, but then there's these outliers, and, and you know, the actual skew between them varies over time. You can't just assume it's some constant amount, and so life is difficult. Um, so that's kind of the, the very short crash course in, in you know, the kinds of things you can do with Beam, the kinds of things it tries to enable you to do very easily. Uh, you know, we talked about the parties for per, per element processing, combined and group by key for aggregation, and uh, touched briefly on event time windowing. Um, we've given a whole bunch of talks uh, about this in much greater depth if you're, if you're curious. Uh, so uh, if you just search the web or, or come grab me afterwards, I can point you towards more resources if you want to learn more. Uh, I want to talk briefly about the roadmap for, for Beam. Uh, a lot of it is focused on, on portability, and since I'm getting short on time and I don't want to take time from Robert, I'm going to skip over these. You can come to these slides. There's a link at the end if you want to see more details. But in short, you know, our, our vision is this. Our vision is to have arbitrary languages on one side, arbitrary execution engines on the, on the, on the other. Uh, reality about a year ago was more like this, where you could do Java on just about anything, and you could do Python and sort of go on one thing. Uh, I'm happy to say that, that with a, you know, thanks to the efforts of, of many of folks within the community, we're, we're in a much better place here at the beginning of 2019, where we're finally getting this portability framework into place, where we've got uh, a multitude of languages on the left side that are all now able to run on at least the ones that have been updated to the new portable runner framework, so Cloud Data Flow, Apache Flink, and, and SAMSA's being bootstrapped now too. Uh, and I, over time, I believe more of these will, will move, and hopefully the, the list of languages will, will increase as well. Um, so I'm going to wrap up here so that Robert can talk, but real quickly, I just want to say, if you want to get involved, uh, come back to the slides and look at these links. You know, we're on Twitter. We've got a YouTube channel if you want to learn more. We've got a Slack channel if you just want to dive in and ask some questions. Uh, we've got a user list and a dev list, is unsurprising for Apache. Um, it's good ways to start, run some pipelines, you know, 
on your favorite runner, report bugs, uh, ask questions on starter on Stack Overflow. If you really want to dive in and contribute, good resources for finding bugs or to, to you know report a fix. Try it out with Java 11. Try things out with Python 3. Write a Go pipeline. You know, try a different I/O at large scale. All sorts of fun stuff like that. Um, and we also have I skipped past it. But we have we have a starter tasks page. So come to Beam. We've got a list of things. You know, if you want to kind of dive in and do some coding. Uh, if you want to get paid to do this stuff, we're hiring Seattle and Sunnyvale. Uh, so uh, talk to those people. Those are the, the friendly recruiters that will make sure that they get routed to me uh, once you go through. So, uh, we're, so we're hiring for the team that's focused on doing Beam work. So if you want to you know, do open source work at Google, please come join us. Uh, there's also uh, openings for a cloud data engineer professional services job. So you can kind of help folks that are working with Beam. Um, but either way, we'd really love to have more folks helping out um, uh, so thank you all for listening to my short, quick intro talk. Uh, that's a link to my Twitter if, if you're curious, or my email if you have questions, link to the slides.